The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by the Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the Johnson County Community College Foundation, which seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of health, financial independence, and topical issues not covered elsewhere. Uh, good evening, thank you for being here tonight. Um, and welcome to the Polsky uh, Practical Personal Enrichment Series. Uh, we are proud to bring you this special presentation, Windows on Culture, Doorways to Understanding, Viewing China Through Architecture. For those of you who are frequent attendees of the Polsky uh, series throughout the year, you'll notice that we are doing something a little different this time. Uh, having our lecture here in the Hudson Auditorium, rather in the Carlson Center's Polsky Theater. Uh, part of that is because the theater wasn't available tonight, and uh, we also felt it uh, truly made sense to have this particular presentation here in the Nerman Museum, where we're surrounded by galleries of contemporary art as we talk about architecture. For some of you, this may be your first visit to the museum, and, and of course the museum would like to welcome you. Uh, the galleries are open tonight until 9. If you have a moment after the lecture to walk through uh, a few of, the, of, of our spaces, uh, we hope you'll do that. Uh, the Polsky, you regulars of the Polsky series, I might also notice something else different tonight. And if you don't, uh, that's kind of scary because I'm not Emily Bierman, uh, who normally gives this this uh, uh, welcoming. Um, I'm Andy Anderson. I'm the Dean of English and Journalism here at the college. Uh, and I, well, I won't even say what else has been added to my duties recently, so, uh, but they've gotten longer. In any case, uh, I want to give a, a very big thanks to the Polsky family. Uh, the Polsky series has been possible by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation within the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation. The series is in partnership with JCCC and includes topics not currently offered elsewhere. You can read more about Norm and Elaine Polsky in the booklets that you have uh, before you. And uh, I'd also like to give a special recognition uh, this evening uh, to members of the family, uh, Renee and Janie, who have joined us uh, for, for this lecture. I also want to call attention to the East-West Center and the special NEH National Endowment for Humanities Bridging Cultures grant, which is helping to underwrite uh, this event tonight. Uh, the official title of this grant is Thinking Through Cultural Diversity, Bridging Cultural Differences in Asian Traditions. For several years as a regional center in cooperation with the East-West Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, JCC has hosted workshops here on campus teaching about Asian culture. Annually, we have sent faculty to seminars at the Asian Studies Development Program in Hawaii, and we've allowed students to study in Japan, Thailand, India, this current year, three NEH, uh, uh, it's a three-year NEH project, which allows a core group of 45 faculty members and administrators from across the United States, uh, including Butler Community College and Dodge uh, City Community College. Uh, and we have, in fact, nine faculty here this evening as part of that grant. Uh, they are here to put together uh, work on syllabi, web resources, public outreach activities, and explore how different Asian societies approach issues of cultural difference. Focusing on China and Southeast Asia, the project also explores how the arts, literature, religious traditions, and trade serve as cultural bridges. Before we introduce our speaker, however, I want to let you know that we will have time for a moderated question and answer session at the end uh, after this presentation. And I invite you to think about questions as you listen to the lecture and write them. Uh, there's cards, again, the regulars know this procedure. Uh, but if you'll write your questions down on these blue cards, uh, we'll pick those up at the end of the lecture. And, and we'll, if you're one of the lucky ones, uh, uh, if all of you have questions, some of you are so out of luck. Uh, but it, we'll, we'll go through those questions. Uh, and, and uh, have, have some time for that. Also, we have the green cards in your booklets, and that's so we can add uh, you to, the, to our mailing list or our emailing list and inform you of, of future uh, special Polsky events. 
We also love to hear your ideas, so if there's topics you want to hear about, uh, put those on the green cards as well. Uh, coming next in the Polsky series, just a little ad here, uh, we want to tell you about our next Polsky event on February the 15th at 7 p.m. Here in the Hudson Auditorium, we will present Dan Himes, president of Terra Nova Nurseries. Dan is nationally known writer and photographer who will take us on a whirlwind tour of 10 horticultural countries and talk about perennials from around the world. He's also going to provide tips on how to get plants into the United States legally, so that you don't want to miss that. Uh, uh, he is appearing here as part of JCC's Horticultural Sciences Field Day, and we're thrilled he'll be a part of the Polsky series that evening as well. And you'll see flyers at the back and more information after this, uh, after this evening. Uh, finally, it's my very real pleasure uh, to, to introduce our speaker tonight. I've, I've had the joy of spending, uh, in fact, I probably shouldn't say because I didn't answer my phone most of the afternoon. Uh, I haven't been doing my job. I've been wandering around looking at art with our speaker. Um, architecture in China is more than a structure a protective roof or, wall, or just walls. It is deeply embedded into a system of culture and belief, orientation, the timing of when parts are put together, and the use of right numbers, measuring the length of windows and doorways, all shape the fate of a building's inhabitants. It is also a highly practical system of engineering and the most modular architectural system ever developed. Jerome Silbergeld, our speaker tonight, is the PY and Kinmei W. Tang Professor of Chinese Art History at Princeton University and Director of Princeton Stong Center for East Asian Art. He was previously the Chair of Art History and Director of the School of Art at the University of Washington. He teaches, publishes, and curates exhibitions on topics in traditional and contemporary Chinese painting, architecture, and gardens, cinema, and photography. He has published more than 60 books articles and book chapters, including the Encyclopedia Britannica entry on Chinese art. It's my very real pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jerome Silver, <laughs> Silbergeld, excuse me, my, uh, I need my water, thank you. Can I be heard? No, that's because I haven't turned this on, I guess, huh? Let's try that, and then I'll ask again. Can I be heard? Is that good? Okay, well, can we bring the lights down, maybe? Whoever does that? There they go. I'm impressed at how many people there are here. If I was home, I'd say half of Princeton just showed up. So I'm, I'm very grateful for an audience for a subject that I obviously like very much. Um, I want to thank Andy. I want to thank all of the people here. Um, he's been hosting me to this whole region and this whole campus for the last 24 hours. And I must say, you people have a wonderful collection of modern contemporary art that I'm I don't know what to say. I did not expect this. Um, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and it is all uh, high museum quality. So if you haven't wandered around the halls of these buildings, really you should do so because you, you don't, I don't know which building I'm in, but every one I'm in seems to be a museum. Um, you notice that Andy read his notes but he asked me not to. <laughs> he said, just talk like you talk to your classes. And the fact is, if I read a lecture to my classes, it would probably be the last thing I ever did. So I said, OK to that. I will just talk to you like I talk to my students. And if anything goes wrong, I'll blame it on Andy. And I will start slowly, and then maybe I'll build up a little bit of speed. And by the time I'm done, or by the time you think I'm done, I'll be going, and you'll say, stop already. And if you need to just walk out, you can just do that too. Um, but I want to talk about a subject that is not much talked about. Um, and that is Chinese architecture, and especially Chinese architectural practice. So I'm condensing a whole lot of stuff into something like 50 minutes. 
Um, I hope there's nobody here who knows the subject better than I do. But um, it is my way of trying to say what I think really counts about this topic. And Andy sort of read the essence of it already, um, and I will stick to that essence. It is not just about putting a roof over your head and walls around the sides of the roof. It's not just about keeping the rain off and the wind out. Um, it's really not just about buildings. It's far more subtle and complicated than that. And it is envisioned by the pre-modern Chinese and by a great many contemporary Chinese as well as being one of those things that really determines your life in ways that you and I would not think about. And so the Chinese don't actually have until modern times a word that is really the equivalent of architecture. And what you and I normally think of as architecture is really something of a misnomer um, for what the Chinese do and think about when they talk about architecture. So there is a lack of terminology, and that's what I would like to explore with you. Um, we tend to think of architecture ourselves, especially in the modern world, but certainly in the world of architectural history and art history in terms of aesthetics, in terms of beauty. Um, we go around the world looking at things and saying ooh and ah. And I could begin just by showing you some pretty pictures and take the burden off of myself. And why not? Um, there are lots of them. And as I show you pretty pictures, it may seem a little false or contradictory for me to say, but that's not what it's about. That in the little bit of writing that there is about Chinese architecture that comes from China itself, that's not what they're talking about. And that's not what they're really thinking about. There is pretty stuff there to be sure, and I could just sort of keep my mouth closed and let you think that's what's critical. Even when you get down to something like the Great Wall, you know, pick the right spot, the right time of day, the right lighting, and it looks good. But Chinese architecture was not meant to look good. It may be a question of appropriateness. It may be sometimes that it is good for Chinese architecture to look big or bigger, grand or grander, depending on who's there, who's living in it, who it's related to. It has a great deal to do with status. But for the most part, and maybe with the exception of Chinese gardens, for the most part, Chinese architecture looks pretty much all alike. And that's often taken as a little bit of a slur. Oh, well, you know, you can't say that. But by and large, it's very standard stuff. And there is a lot more going on than the eye even sees. And learning to see and learning to look and learning to think about what is going on has been something of a mystery and something of a challenge for a number of reasons, one of which is that the Chinese didn't bother to write about their architecture until very recent times, with the exception of a few building manuals that have survived. The Chinese have been writing about other things They've been writing both theory and criticism in the realm of Chinese painting since at least the fourth, fifth century. They've been writing extensive histories of painting since the ninth century. But they did not bother to write about architecture at all in the same way until well after the beginning of the 20th century. It was not considered within the purview of gentlemen, of the scholars, of the consumers, of the educated elite to engage themselves other than telling their own builders, put it here, put it there, make it bigger, or whatever. It was not something one wrote about. 
it did not fit into the categories of what we think of as art with a capital A. And even to this day, the teaching of Chinese architecture never takes place in the art academies, never takes place in the same place that the teaching of painting and calligraphy would take place, or even sculpture and lesser arts. So it looks good, but that's not what counts. At least sometimes it looks good. With regard to those building manuals, the first of them that we know about goes back to the late 11th century. It was done under the Gungbu, or the Board of Works, that was responsible for things like building the imperial palaces. It was presented to the emperor himself in the year 1103. It was used for a period of time. We don't exactly know how long. It went through a couple of editions within the next 40, 50 years or so. And then it just sort of disappears from view and from history until it's recovered. We think it's essentially rediscovered in the early 20th century by Juji Chen around the year 1925. It looks like this single page that you see on the right. Its real purpose has nothing to do with aesthetics. It's not saying, here's the way to make things look really nice. It is essentially a manual designed to standardize the process, to say who gets what in the status system, to affect economic efficiencies, so that if you're putting together a big building, you know how many pieces of what sizes you need in a modular sense. You're going to put up a palace. Well, what kind of a palace? How many bays does it have? How long is the roof? And so on and so forth. Here's what you're going to need. And here's what it's going to cost you. The Pentagon could use one of these. <laughs> it was then passed on to Liang Shicheng within just a couple of years. And Liang Shicheng is considered to be essentially the father of this discipline. His own father, <clears throat> Liang Qichao, was famous in China as the, one of the first great modern philosophers. He was a student of John Dewey, studied in the United States, was a pragmatist, was a very practical man, and raised very practical children. One of his sons was one of the first leading archaeologists, modern archaeologists in China, willing to get his hands into the dirt, which gentlemen before this time simply did not do. Liang Sicheng was willing to do the same, he was willing to climb up under the eaves of a building. How did he get there? This is not something any Chinese gentleman, any Chinese scholar, any Chinese writer of pre-modern times would have done. This is the first generation willing to undertake such things without feeling like they are losing face for their families. It was not easy for him to deal with this book. He found that he couldn't just simply open it and read it. It was full of Chinese characters that he couldn't read, just like me. You say, what's that mean? Look it up in a dictionary, and it's not there. Look it up in a classical dictionary, and it's not there. The great classical dictionaries of the Kangxi period had 40,000 characters. Still not there. Because these were, I don't know where they came up with the characters, but they were for terms, A, that had not been used for centuries, and B, even the ones that continued down through use, were basically private. They were used by builders, carpenters. If I say architects, I'm using that word again that I shouldn't be using. They were used by people who handed down knowledge of how to build things by families, 
within guilds. And they were part of, here's how we do it. And we're not going to tell you how we do it. That's what keeps us in business. It's like the Coca-Cola company. We're not going to give you our formula, and we're not going to write it down. So he's trying to figure these things out by taking his book around with him and saying, this says this, and that looks like that. What's the relationship between these things? And it took him 10 or 15 years to figure it all out. So the biggest part of his task, aside from mere translation, was to apply this somehow. One of the central features that he had to deal with was that nobody knew the age of buildings. Chinese architecture by the first century BCE was so well developed as an engineering system that there wasn't much left to do with it. All it could do would be to change very slowly. It could evolve, but it never went through the kinds of revolutions that happened in Europe periodically that took us, as our students know, from the Romanesque to the Gothic to the Renaissance to, did I leave out Baroque, Baroque neoclassical, modern, some of which were very rapid changes. Gothic was invented on the spot by one person, more or less. Nothing of that kind happened in China. Evolution was so slow that nobody saw it happening. And by the time that this man comes along, nobody knew the date of any particular building. If it was 1,000 years old or 500 years old, nobody knew the difference. Moreover, Chinese buildings were made of parts that were meant to be replaced, so no building simply had one age or one date. It had many replaced parts. So at best, you could talk about when was the thing first put up and wonder, well, how much of it was left from that time. So it's a very complicated kind of process. One of the things that he really, well, two things that he really had in mind, one of which was to develop a kind of index of age to determine which buildings are relatively new, which buildings go back to the Ming Dynasty, which go back to the Yuan Dynasty, which go all the way back to the Song. And secondly, within that scheme, he had an even loftier goal. That was a little bit private, but he wanted to find something that was older than anything that could be found, not in China, but in Japan. Because the only really, really, really old buildings to be found that went back to the equivalent of the Chinese Tang Dynasty were Chinese designed buildings in Japan the old Buddhist temples like the Horyuji, built under the auspices of Chinese priests. But as far as he knew, no such buildings existed in China until he ran into the Foguang Temple that you see below and was finally able to date it to 857, which became the oldest surviving wooden building in China. Today we know it's not. It's the second oldest. And he'd be even happier to know that. But he didn't live long enough to find out. I should say something before continuing on about his legacy. People follow him in China. Strangely enough, in America, I can only think of maybe four people who make this their profession to study the history of Chinese architecture. And I only know of one or two other people like myself who even dabble in it in the classroom. So we're not making a whole lot of rapid progress. It's not like there are lots of books coming out and lots of new research being developed. There's lots of repetition taking place. There's a lot of nice photographs. And you've had a share of that. But it's a very slow moving thing. And the kind of thing that I find really interesting, the relatedness of it to practice both by the people who make it and by the people who consume it, really has yet to be written about. People spend most of their time writing about brackets. Everybody loves brackets. You say, well, what's the point of that? I'll tell you what the point of that is a little bit later. It's a big point. But 
It's a small focus. Now, we have to shift gears if we want to think about how people think about things. Epistemology, how do we learn about things? Well, we learn about things at our mother's knee. We learn about things that become our lifelong expectations when we're very young. In modern times, we do it reading, kids' books. In this case, it was at Father's Knee. And this is a book that I read my twins when they were three years old. And a few years later, I realized, hmm, that's how we learn about Western architecture. We read, Bear wants to build his house. <laughs> so Bear wanted to build a house. And he wondered, where do you begin when you want to build? And he said, first things first. And the first thing is the basement. And you all know that. When you see a big hole in the ground being dug, if it's not small enough for a body, if it's big enough, it's a building. <laughs> and you know something's happening in the neighborhood if that's where you live is going to be noisy for the next three to six months, if not longer. And so Bear began at the bottom. And he brought in the steam shovel, and he brought in his friend Moose, and dug a big hole. And he said, this will be the basement of my house. Now, that's not what happens in China. And that's not what ha would happen in any Chinese children's book. You don't bring in a moose. <laughs> and you don't dig a hole in the ground. That's the last thing you would think of doing, unless you wanted to bury that body. Quite the opposite. You seal the ground. You build a platform that will last forever and you drop your building on top of it. And you may say, why? And that, of course, is what this is all about. Why? What are you thinking? If you've ever been to Barnes & Noble, is there anybody here who's never been to Barnes & Noble? And you stand in the checkout line, and you see the books on Chinese feng shui, the sex of feng shui, Feng Shui for Better Romance. <laughs> I can tell you that 10 years ago, you probably never heard of Feng Shui. Is there anybody here who's heard of, if you've heard of Feng Shui, would you raise your hand? Oh, that's fabulous. How many, oh, keep your hand up. Now, put your hand down if you couldn't tell me about Feng Shui. Keep it up if you can tell me about Feng Shui, what you know about it. OK. <laughs> Most hands went down. Maybe because you never read the sex of feng shui. You should read it. <laughs> but it's all garbage. It's, it's not feng shui. It, 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 it's, at best, it's Hong Kong feng shui. It's new feng shui for the American consumers. So what is real feng shui? Well, real feng shui is, by any other name, very old in China. And it is absolutely fundamental. And it says that if we want to really begin at the beginning of this story, without moose, you don't begin with a building. You begin with the relationship of that building to the environment. And by the environment, I don't just mean the environment that you and I might think of, or the environment that you can just see. You need an environmental specialist. Somebody who knows things that you do not know, he will probably be the equivalent of a Taoist priest. And he knows how to read the life energy of the earth, and where the energy channels of the earth flow, and where they stall out, where they stagnate. And he's able to read into the environment things that really matter even more than a roof over your head. This also goes by a name that Barnes & Noble hasn't heard of, which is Kanyu. And I want you to pay attention to these names. Feng Shui means wind and water. It comes from those two characters. Well, what is it about wind? What is it about water? The equivalent word is Kanyu, which means the canopy and a chariot. The canopy over the chariot and the chariot itself. There's a relation between those two terms. What is it? 
What are they thinking about when they come up with those two metaphors, essentially? Think about it, and I'll give you time to think about it. But I can tell you that if I look at an old Chinese painting, or if I look at a map of a major Chinese city, like Beijing, there's a relationship. When you look at a map, you know which is north and which is south, right? When I look at a landscape painting, I know which is north. I know which is east. Because they do the same things, if they're doing it right, all the time. And certainly, if they're building a Taoist temple, and I think I've got a pointer here. Pointer's up, Nathaniel. Up. That's a Taoist temple. The guy who you want to hire to locate your building comes from a place like this. He's not going to do it wrong. Well, the technique of deciding how to cite has gone through its own evolution. In fact, even here there is revolution. In the oldest times, when a king wanted to build a palace, or even more, when a king wanted to cite his capital city, he didn't just say, I love this place. I want to build right by the Missouri River. He didn't even say anything. He asked his priest. And his priest would come equipped with a bunch of shells or bones, either the big, broad scapula of an ox that was, relayed, that was raised on the temple grounds, slaughtered ritually for the occasion, or the carapace, the underside of a big seagoing turtle. Then they would take that bone or that shell and they would grind it down till there were th some thin spots in it, a series of thin spots up and down the sides. And then they would apply heat to it and the shell would crack or the bone would crack and determined by the cellular nature of that material, the bones would crack that way or that way. And Bill Gates would like this. The priest would come along and he would say in a binary sense, off, on, off, on. Up, down, up, down, up, 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 down, up. And that sequence of events, just like a computer would say, do this or don't do this. Everything was raised as a yes, no question. So if you say, do I want to build by the Missouri River? Bring your priest in and he says, up, down, up, 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 up. No, got to go further south, something like that. Do we believe this? It doesn't matter. The king believed this. And so we know from ancient writings, the oldest writings that survive in China in textual form, I give you an example. When the ruler of the second dynasty wanted to build his new capital city at the beginning of the dynasty, the Duke of Zhou followed the protector, Xiao Gong, and grandly he surveyed the eastern lands in order to found a capital where he will be the people's glorious sovereign. Then on a carefully selected, ritually selected day, Yi Mao, in the morning, I came to the intended capital at Luo, which is modern day Luoyang. I took the oracle concerning the region of the Li River to the north of the Yellow. Then I took the oracle concerning the region of the east of the Jin River and west of the Chan. But it was the region of law that was commanded by the oracle, and that's why Luoyang is there today. And I didn't like that. It's not what I wanted, or maybe it's not what the king wanted. But it's what I was told. So what do I do? I think, maybe it made a mistake. I'll ask again. And so I took the oracle again, about east of the John River, and that's apparently what the king wanted. But no way. It was the law that was commanded. I have sent a messenger to come to the king to bring a plan and to present the oracles to him, and you go with what the bones tell you. And that's how you cite something in the oldest times. This is about 
1050 BCE. In later times, it goes through a number of different other methods, including especially what we primarily think of as feng shui today, which is looking at land formations and understanding like a somebody who wants to find water and uses a, what's it called, the um, dowsing stick. Somebody's out there and he can feel the flow of energy and all of this gets systematized into certain shapes, certain forms, certain conjunctions in association with the five elements. Wood, fire, earth, metal, water. If you have a mountain that represents wood and it's located near the base of a bigger mountain shaped like fire, want your house to burn down? It's a bad combination. Don't go there. And so forth. And you can read smaller shapes and the later little bit of manuals that we have, not building manuals, but feng shui manuals. Say, this example has two crescent-shaped ponds with ponds in the curving shape of the character one in front of the main hall. Then men and women will come and go like the sound of wind in this place, and that's not good because men and women don't mix. Men will be few and women many, which is really a misfortune, giving rise to dissolute living among the husbands and sons-in-law. Don't do that. Don't have a river like that, shaped like a jade belt. Don't put willow trees out in front of your house, etc. You may ask why. Don't bother to ask. You don't know, and he's not going to tell you. Don't do it. Later on, they come up with the compass as a device. Well, the Chinese invented the magnetic needle in the Han Dynasty, which is a long time ago. And this is one of the first practical uses that it was ever put to in the world. How it works, I've never figured out. It makes no sense to me. They use something called a law pond, which is a series of radially concentric circles with information on them. And I would think if this is going to work, you've got to be able to adjust one circle in relationship to the other. But if you move it, the whole thing moves all at once. So I don't know how it works. And I've never met anybody who does. <laughs> and I don't expect to. Because if they did, they would say they didn't. Nobody's going to tell me. And these are the regions of China where they were used, primarily up in the north for the Luo Pan, further in the south especially. And then in the last seven, 800 years, they all sort of come together. But the fact is, if you live in a city, you don't have much to choose from. You've got a little plot of land. Your great, 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 great granddaddy had that same plot of land. And nothing much is going on. You can't do much with that. You may not even be building a house. Maybe because all of this determines good luck and bad luck. You've already got your house and you're having bad luck. If you're having bad luck, the first thing you think of is your house. What's gone wrong? Something about the flow of energy. And how can you change things? You can't pick your house up and move it. You can't even pick a different plot. Most people, it's not even a matter of carpentry. It's a matter of getting your Taoist priest to do something. So he can come along and say, well, there's some bad carpentry here. I can fix it. But better still, he can give you some good luck charms. Or maybe if you're building, that's something he may say, you know what? You forgot to pay the guy on time. And he's put some really bad luck stuff in your house. And for a price, I'll take it out. I'll correct the situation. So builders, feng shui masters, are powerful people in the community. You've got a problem. You don't go to your doctor first thing. You don't go to the fortune teller. That's the fortune teller. You go to your architect, to use that word. 
that big conglomerate thing. You go to the people who deal with housing. If you've had a bad architect in the past, the odds are you're going to have another architect somewhere along the line. And they can come along and they can put rice grains on the end of your beams. They can put two copper coins face down. They can put a brush and an ink stick. Or if you weren't paying attention, they can put a hank of hair tied around a knife. This reminds me of all the stuff that Tom Sawyer's carrying around in his pockets. <laughs> they can put a white tiger on a beam above a door, and boy, then you're in trouble. And maybe they did, and maybe that's what happened, and you've got to root it out. So people are constantly running to their architects. This is not architecture, Western style. This is a whole different mode of dealing with buildings and environments. But there's one big part of the equation that's been left out, and it goes back to this term wind and water, canopy and chariot. What is it about these two terms? What you're looking for is harmony. Everybody's looking for harmony, yeah? You're looking for harmony between your built environment and the rest of the world you live in. You want your built environment to be related well to the flow of things. Things, what does that mean? Well, it means everything. That's what it means, everything. The wind is above, the water is below. The canopy is above, the chariot is below. You're talking about heaven and earth. It's not just the earth. It's the heavens, too. So how do you control the heavens? That's the hardest part. What are you going to do, move the moon? The Earth is pretty stable. You don't see very frequently mountains rise and fall, right? The Earth is place. But the heavens are time. It's a time-place relationship. The heavens are constantly rotating. They're constantly moving. So every bit as important as the shape of place around you is the timing of things. Everything in building has to be timed. When you cut the wood that's going to be put in the building, when you cut the wood that's going to be protected by a shelter where you protect the wood, and that wood has to be cut at the right time. When you put in the threshold, when you put in the hearth, most importantly, when you put in the main roof beam. Everything has to be timed. How do you know when to time it? You use the equivalent of a farmer's almanac. You use an almanac, a carpenter's almanac. How do you get one? You buy it. It is known that in around the year 1500, when the West was just learning how to print books, these almanacs were sold annually in editions of 500,000. Get yourself one. You won't know how to read it. So timing is extremely important. Who controls timing? Well, most importantly, the emperor has to control timing for everybody. He's the intermediary between heaven and earth. He's got to understand heaven. If there's going to be an eclipse, if there's going to be stars falling, he better know it, ideally in advance. So he's very concerned with the equivalent of clockworks. So it's no accident that Kublai Khan, this horrible barbarian, we think, put up this gigantic astrolabe that you can still see if you drive down the main street of Peking, Chang'an Dajie, this huge 12-foot or so tall astrolabe stands there on one of the last remnants of Beijing's Great Wall. And it's likewise no accident that the great Qing emperors like Kangxi and Qianlong, when they first saw Western escarpments in French, Italian, 
British clocks. They wanted them. And so they had the palaces loaded with clocks. And today, in the last few years, I don't know exactly when, the Forbidden City opened a clockworks museum and put all their clocks in one place. Some of the best clocks, early clocks in the world are now to be found in that collection because the emperors needed to know timing. Well, so too does your builder. This is important stuff. It is private stuff. Nobody's going to tell you about it. And what it also means is that to a certain, in a certain sense, your builder is encroaching on the exclusive knowledge of the emperor. And it means that all of these guys have power over you, and you don't know what to do about it. Just make sure they're well paid, well taken care of. But there is a hostile relationship between emperors and builders, between builders and clients. People fear their architects. That's guaranteed. Architects are powerful people in the society. They have secret knowledge that only the emperor can outdo. Not only that, there's one more piece of the formula, and that's numerology, magic numbers. There are good numbers and there are bad numbers. The standard carpenter's ruler, the standard carpenter's square, were broken up into units. The square was broken up into color, colors that represented units, and some of them were good and some of them were bad. And so if you look around at that door behind you, is there a door that you can see here? Can everybody see a door? Can you tell me, is that a good door or a bad door? Did it use the right numbers or not? By looking, you don't know. And you don't have a square or a ruler to check it out. So it is or it isn't, but you're not going to know except by the results. Think about it. This is a power trip. And when I show you these beautiful pictures, is this a good building or a bad building? It's not a question of whether it looks good. Is the timing right? Is the location right? Is the numerology correct? You don't know, and neither do I. And I don't even know how to find out. So if I bring this into my classroom and I tell my students, look at this, it's so lovely. That's not very Chinese. That's not very traditional. What we're doing and what they were doing are entirely different. So we come along and we start to see this stuff beginning very late in the 19th century. And the first person to write about it that we know is the Jesuit scholar J.J.M. de Groot, one of these dour Dutchmen. And he says, what a heap of junk this is. It fully shows the dense cloud of ignorance which hovers over the Chinese people, exhibiting in all its nakedness the low condition of their native culture. Well, OK. If you want to be that way about it, you can. You can say this is superstition. This is black magic. You can teach it in those terms, or you can think of it in those terms. I'm totally neutral about it. I only tell you what I know about it, not what I like or dislike about it. And there are other people who come along, like the greatest historian of anybody's science, which is Joseph Needham, who wrote a, well, who designed and partly wrote a gigantic series. It's that long on my shelves, and he's not done yet. Well, he's done. He's dead. But his successors continue this massive study of science and technology in China which totally revolutionized our understanding of early science history. And he says, you know, so there's some really good stuff here. These guys aren't a bunch of dummies. So he says, we've already seen enough to appreciate the frank absurdity 
referring back to Mr. De Groot, of this kind of judgment. And we shall now see that all geoman although geomancy itself was, of course, always a pseudoscience, it was nevertheless the true mother of our knowledge of terrestrial magnetism, just as astrology was of astronomy, and alchemy, also invented by the Chinese before it went west, was of chemistry. And so that's the first chapter of a course in Chinese architectural history. The second would be to say, OK, it's not all about buildings, but let's look at a building anyway. And let's look at what the Chinese do. And when it comes to real buildings, they do some very clever things. They're very practical. And they're very practical at working with very scarce resources. The most important and scarcest of the resources, growing scarcer all the time, is lumber. Up north, deforestation was massive by the first century, by the end of the first millennium CE. So they are constantly dealing with the retreat of the great forest as forests either to the far northeast or to the deep south, to the degree that when they finally had to rebuild the Temple of Heaven in the year 19, uh, 1898, I think it was, they had to import Douglas fir from the state of Oregon. But if you look at their use of it, what they're building with is mostly not wood. And we all talk about Chinese wooden architecture. It's mud. It's dirt. They build a wooden skeleton, and the rest of it is made out of dirt. That foundation on the ground was made out of dirt that was pounded with a small accumulation of water in thin layers within forms until it became as hard as rock. And they learned very, very early on, before the first of the dynasties, by 2000 BCE, they were pounding earth that survives today. You can see where the old post holes were. Man-made stone. So they may, if it's a fine building, they may finish this foundation with real stone, but it's made primarily out of man-made stone. The walls are made out of wattle, bamboo, something like that, then rough dirt packed together, then fine dirt, and then lime finish. Lime finish to keep the bugs off. You still see the structure of wood, a little bit of it, but look how little wood there is here just enough to basically hold up the roof. And the roof is made out of dirt. It's tiles, clay tiles. Sun-baked in most cases in a really fancy establishment, an imperial palace. It will be enameled. Um, it will be like good <clears throat> ceramic. It will be fired. But most of these are just sun-baked. It's just dirt. They're very practical. And if it's a fancy building, it will have brackets. Why will it have brackets? It will have brackets so that the roof can be extended. Bracketing is a cantilevering system that lets you put an eave way out beyond the columns. Well, why not just put it with the columns? Well, you want your roof to go out beyond the columns so that the water will drain beyond the walls and beyond the foundation because you don't want the wood to get wet. That's what bracketing is for. It's very simple. It's very practical. All of these things follow very much set patterns. We put our houses in the middle of our property so that when I go out in my PJs in the morning to pick up the New York Times, everybody sees me. I've got no privacy. We think that the Chinese have no privacy. They have much more privacy than we do, at least traditionally, because they put their building on the outside of their property. They put their property inside as a courtyard. Then if they get more property, they attach another courtyard. So they have a courtyard structure in which buildings serve a dual function. One, they're a building. You can do things there. Two, it can become a gateway into the next territory 
that lies beyond or to the side. And so you have courtyard structure and you have compounding. This is, of course, the imperial palace. It just goes on and on and on. So it's highly compounded. It's also axial. It's set in the right directions. I could talk at great length why they do this, but the north is bad, the south is good, every major building faces south, turns its back to the north, secondary buildings are west facing east or east facing west. Buildings that are associated with military functions are Sorry, wrong side, on the west. Buildings that are associated with civil functions, like, does this include the Imperial Library is right down, right there. Civil functions to the east. The east is positive, like the north, although a little less positive. The west is negative. I take that backwards, sorry. The east is positive, like the south. The west is positive like, is negative like the north, only slightly less so. North is really negative, south is really positive, and everything is oriented in this way. All of your major buildings line up on axis. All of your secondary buildings form the outer structure of your courtyards. So if I am um, over here and looking in that direction, I'll get an image that looks like this. That's where this photograph, this photograph was taken from here looking at that building right there. Doesn't make sense. It looks messy. It's confusing. Although looked at this way, everything's so neat and orderly. So all of this architecture, among other things, is telling you where you stand to gain order, where you can go in order to maintain order, with a kind of a hierarchy of buildings that is partly directional, that says you can't go from here to here. If you want to go from here to here, you've got to come down here, cross over here, and go up there. So it is busy telling you things, in this case, that you do know, that you should know, that everybody must know. It is ordering you around, unlike that other stuff we were talking about that you can't know. You're supposed to know this. It is shouting it at you, and it is giving you all kinds of clues, one of which is directional. And as you move through these directions, it's also telling you whether you are ascending to a higher order, not just of buildings, but of things that happen in buildings and who makes them happen. Each time you move from courtyard to courtyard, you go up and down, higher up and down, still higher up if you're moving north until you reach a pinnacle and then everything descends according to this kind of a formula. The most important building is right there. That is the Hall of Central Harmony. Pay attention to one thing about it. All of the other buildings in this diagram are rectangular. They're all rectilinear. All of the others are rectangular. This is the only building that is radially symmetrical. It is square. If you see a square building, you know something. You won't see many. It's very special. And it'll become obvious why. One other set of signals is roof types. There are a limited number of roof types. Whether the roof is doubled, whether it's full-hipped, whether it's hip and gable, whether it's simple gable, whether the roof at the gable end extends beyond the walls, or not, there are words for all of these things. Whether it has eaves decoration, oops, hit the wrong button, I guess. 
but you can still see those questions extending beyond, not extending beyond, whether it has these kind of ridge decor and so forth. All of those are signals. They go together, let me go back if I can go back. They go together with scale. So everything is coordinated, location, size, bracketing, the number of bays of a building, the kind of roofing, whether it's glazed or not, roof type, roof decoration, they all fit like a puzzle. All coordinated. This is the Hall of Central Harmony. The only buildings that have a radially symmetrical footprint, floor plan, either round or square, are essentially, because your building was straight timbers in China, they're all round. They're all approximations of the round. Because on the inside, what's happened, let me go back one step, or maybe two, what's happened with this structure. What happens, you have a gable building, open gable end, you have a full hip building, and you can see that your roof beam has been shortened to allow for this inset triangulation for the hips. And this is essentially an extreme version of this, four hips reaching a point with no roof beam at all. Yeah, they're all related structurally. You get to that point, and the only place you find these kinds of buildings are state temples, Buddhist temples, Buddhist pagodas, tombs, garden pavilions. These are all sacred buildings, including your garden building, which this tells me refers to the originally sacred nature of the Chinese garden, which goes back exclusively to the imperial park. Only the emperor, only the kings, there weren't even emperors yet, had the earliest parks. Gardens is a devolution in later times from the exclusive purview of the ruler because it gathered power. Nobody else could have one. It was sacred and special. It is the dome of heaven. It is the original canopy. All of these characteristics are shared everywhere by everything. Temples, tombs, palaces, homes, and when you look at different aspects of the whole thing, it all starts to look alike because everything's thought out in the same way. You look at just the columns and brackets. You look at the layout of courtyards and compounds. You look at the structure of the whole city, and they all somehow look alike because they're all incredibly modular. They're all made up of their component parts. They're all rectilinear, built on two or three dimensions. Whether it's a palace that goes on and on, whether it's a single home, whether it's one or two courtyards, the same principles follow. Lesser stuff in the south, major stuff in the north. You put your servants down here, you put your kitchen down here, you put your privy down here. You get your first courtyard, if you're going to put up a guest, you put him here, he'll take over one of the kids' rooms. These are tots who can run around this courtyard. This is your guest hall. This is your major hall. Your ancestral altar should be right here. The doors really ought to be there and there because you can't go out there. This is as far as any guest goes. No guest goes back here. This is private territory back here. Relatively speaking, every structure follows these same principles. You go in, you, go only, oh, you only go so far. Second generation, oldest generation. This is grandma and grandpa. This is mom and pop. These are the kids. She's to the west, in her garden, his bedrooms to the east, 
his garden, their common room in the center. It's a principle that applies across all status levels of Chinese society. A city's pretty much the same thing, just a bunch of squares put together, broken up into major and minor sectors, lesser to the south, so the poor people live down here, the rich people get bigger blocks, bigger houses, the big guy lives back here, and so forth. Liang Sichang, here's the last chapter. Liang Sichang in his Ying Zhao Fasha. Why do we pay so much attention to brackets? Well, one, they are a distinctive feature of Chinese architecture. And they're cool. I always thought if I wasn't so dumb, I would be making brackets out of plastic like Legos and selling them, and I'd be a rich man. And you'd put together one of these bracket sets, and you'd all buy one because it was cool, and you'd buy it at Christmas time for your grandkids or whatever. And I've tried to get my students interested in doing it. I'm still waiting. I mean, think of it in Japan. Look at the market that's there. It turns out that in an evolutionary sense, the best way to date a building is to look at the evolutionary place of its bracket set. It's just like looking at bones. And you give a paleologist a little bit of a cheekbone or a chin bone, and he says, I think it's human. And my goodness, it seems to be pre-Cro-Magnon or something like that. How do they do that? Well, they learn the details. And that's what he did. He learned the details. And with that, he was able to provide an index of buildings down through the ages. And these are very complicated things. They're serving a very simple purpose. But structurally, they get ever more complicated, ever more sophisticated, until finally it reaches a pinnacle of sophistication around the year 1200. And then it just sort of ossifies and becomes, after that, increasingly less functional and increasingly more decorative. And so he is able to look at patterns very old, very simple, coming down, developing such things as a downward slanting arm and ong, a three-step bracket, a two-step bracket, a one-step a one-step bracket, a no-step bracket, and so forth. And the proportions change. <clears throat> Back in the Tang Dynasty, which was his thrill, these bracket sets were huge. One-third of the entire height from Eve's purlin to the ground was bracket set, a two to one ratio, basically. By the Qing, the late Ming or Qing dynasty, about one sixth. And so it changes. Too slow for anybody to notice, but an architectural historian can go there. I've decided that there's a better way to do it. And that's to look at things that are non-structural. Look at the decoration. I'm not going to go there with you tonight, but I have written my only real article on Chinese architecture as related to painting, where you see all of those fashions in both. And those can change easily, because they're not structural. Fashions can come and go. And it turns out they come and go much quicker than changes in the evolution of the bracket. So that's for the next generation to undertake. And it's all modular. That's what a bracket is. It's these pieces put together in set ways. They are sets. And in any one given time, the way brackets are put together in new buildings, if your building is status level enough to have brackets, your home wouldn't, mine wouldn't, but the mayor would, the governor would, the White House would, the temple would, the schools probably would, and so forth. If they have brackets, they're part of a modular system. 
Chinese love modularity. Chinese characters are made out of basically eight kinds of brush strokes. Out of that, you can get 40,000 characters. They actually have component parts within that. A painting of Chinese bamboo is just three kinds of strokes, stems, joints, and leaves. Out of that, you can get an infinite number of paintings. But there's nothing so unique about that. All architecture is modular. This building is modular. Look at the lights above. Look at everything around you. What a pain it would be to build if it wasn't modular. So going all the way back to anonymous architecture, the Greeks, the Goths, the Renaissance named architects, it's all modular. So what's the difference? The difference is simply that the Chinese is more modular. And how can you say it's more modular? Well, I can show you how much more modular it is, in part with the benefit of this ancient manual. We can understand, and I'm getting to the very end here, the Chinese are very status conscious, whether you get brackets or not whether you get a double roof or not, whether you get a hip and gable. No, we're not going to get full gables. We're probably going to get, we're only going to get gable ended buildings at our home. We're not even going to get hip and gable. So all of this stuff follows status sequences. And it tells you when you look at any home what you're looking at. And there are legal regulations that say you can or you can't. You can't have this by law. Not only that, here's where it gets really fascinating. The governor's house and my house are entirely different in one regard. When the guys come to measure those good numbers and bad numbers, they don't all use the same ruler. They don't all use the same carpenter square. His house gets a bigger ruler, and every unit of measure is proportionately bigger. Eight sizes of ruler, eight units of size. Everything within my house is relative to that size. That size is taken from this part of the bracket, that part right where is it? Located up here. Right there. From there to there of the bracket is my unit of measure. If I'm building a bigger building, the bracket has the same parts, but every little bit of it is a little bit bigger, or a little bit bigger, or a little bit smaller. So there are essentially eight different inches. And think of it. To the eye, it means that if I give you two slides, two images photographically, you can't tell the difference. Because everything is proportionate. And think of it in engineering terms. If I'm putting up a bigger roof, I don't just have more columns. I have bigger columns, and I probably want bigger columns because I'm holding more weight per square foot. So it makes perfectly good sense practically, and it makes perfectly good sense symbolically. And then I distribute it in a rational way so that relative to how big anything can be in my courtyard, if I can get up to number one scale, then I put my biggest structure my biggest units for building structure right here. Number two goes here and here and here and here and here. Number three goes here and here and here and here and here. Number four goes here and here. And it all makes sense. That's modularity. Unlike even in Japan, which never picked up on this, or Korea, which never picked up on this. This is the thoroughness of a system of values and belief that's just a different story. 
than building a big box on Sixth Avenue in New York City. And the study of it is a study in values, belief systems, practical systems, natural ecology, and so forth. It's a very complicated matter. It's a very Chinese matter. It's a very rewarding matter to study. And it reminds you that in some ways, we're not all the same. So, an epilogue. Buildings aren't just buildings. Buildings are where things take place. You and I have probably all gone at some point in our life to visit some historical building. Have you been to Harry Truman's home? Is there any reason why you went to Harry Truman's home that has to do with architecture? Or is it because Harry Truman lived there? I think I know the answer. So what happens in a building shapes the building. If a building has a history, it's not just a material history. It's a historical history. And from large to small, if we're talking about important buildings, they have important histories. And sometimes something very small can have a very big history. And so I show you one last example. This comes from way back here. Do you know what this is? A water pump. I have water pump. Do I have anything else? It's a well curb so you don't fall into the well in the courtyard. There's water down there. So the story takes place. And if you go to Beijing, if you go to the Forbidden City, if you either lead a group through or go with a tour guide, they will all tell you the same story. Because everybody knows it, everybody loves it, everybody hates it. In the year 1900, during the Boxer Rebellion, Beijing was invaded by allied forces of France, Britain, and the United States. The royal family went out the back door. They fled west to what today is called Xi'an. The power of the royal family wasn't on the throne. It was behind the throne. The emperor was a young man. His grandmother pushed him around, told him what to do, sat behind a yellow curtain and whispered orders in his ears, and he did what she told him. And she just wanted to be sure that one day when they got back from Xi'an to Beijing that things would be the same as they were when they left him, when they left. And so simply, in order to remind this young fellow who's the boss, she took his favorite concubine and stuffed her head down in that well. Well, she had it done. And the lesson was made. It's not a very pretty story, but I bet you're going to remember this one. It's not written by Alfred Hitchcock. It's written by the Dowager Empress, Sissi. And it means that this little thing, I bet you remember this for a while, after you've forgotten lots of other things that I've had to say. That's it. Thank you. Our organizers are organizing. If you have, actually, I think what we'll try and do, if you have some questions, uh, if you'll just shout them out, well, we have time for just a few. Uh, yeah. Why do they turn up the corners of the roof and make the roof kind of concave a little bit? Did everybody hear the question? Why do the corners of the roofs turn up and make them concave a little bit? Well, that's it. we know how they do it. It's pretty easily done. But you asked, why do they do it? And I think the answer, in a way, is nobody knows. If you go back to the Tang Dynasty, the roofs were all straight. The 
angle of the roof lines were all low. If you go forward into the Sung Dynasty, it goes up into the Ming and Qing, it goes up and up, and the curve starts to come in, especially in the south. People say it looks, for the Chinese write, that it looks like the wings of a bird and so forth. It's simply a fashion that caught on. It caught on belatedly, it caught on geographically, and gradually over time, it gets bigger and snazzier to the point that it looks gaudy and gauche to the eye, especially of a northerner or of an, an aesthete who says, you know, it's so elegant just to stay low and simple. But there is something that people obviously liked about it. And beyond that, it's just a question, why do people like what they like in terms of taste? It, there's no functionality to it. There is no mythology associated with it. It's not really part of a belief system. It is pure fashion. And it is one of those aspects of fashion that one can date because it's not structural. It can be changed very easily with how you build up the material along your ridge lines. Let me tell you Donald Trump's answer to that. <laughs> when Donald Trump built the Trump Tower, he said, if 10% of my potential clients want good feng shui, everybody's going to get good feng shui. Now, that's not quite the answer to your question, is do they know how to deliver good feng shui? And if Donald Trump says he's given it, do they know they got it? <laughs> And I don't know the answer to that. I have wanted to meet Donald Trump and to ask him, OK, what's the feng shui of this all about? And my guess is he doesn't have a clue either. He probably paid good money to have good feng shui masters come in and do something. But I doubt that they were willing to tell even him what it was they were getting paid to do. <laughs> yeah, because that's part of their formula. Like the Coca-Cola company. Donald Trump doesn't know the formula to Coca-Cola, and I bet he couldn't buy it. So that, that's all I know how to say, Tim, is uh, it, uh, have they adjusted it? It has nothing to do with the books that you buy at Barnes & Noble, but as they practice in San Francisco and New York City, have they changed it? It's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. They believe in it. Um, Mao Zedong thought it was junk. He thought it was superstition. It was not scientific materialism. He tried to stamp it out. As soon as he was stamped out, it came back with a force. Um, if you look at the Jin Mao Tower, which is the tallest building in China, at least I think it still is. It was. It was once briefly, because there's this race on to reached the moon. It was once the tallest building in the world. It is a series of steps. Each time you go up, you go in a step. The proportionality of each of those inward steps is one eighth, another eighth, which is to say each eighth is slightly different, getting smaller, an eighth of what's left, an eighth of what's left, an eighth of what's left. Why? For the same reason that the Olympics that the Chinese got the Olympics in the year 2008 and began on the eighth second of the eighth minute of the eighth hour of the eighth day of the eighth month because eight was considered a lucky number. Back to you, Tim. Do, do these things change? 20 years ago, the number eight was lucky in Hong Kong, unlucky in Beijing. It's a yin number. It's a female number. It's a bad number. It's a northern number. A young number is nine. Nine's the great number. How nine got supplanted by eight, I have no idea, except Hong Kong got rich first. 
and now eight is considered to be a lucky number all over China. It just baffles me, and their rationalization for it makes no sense. It says the word eight is ba. Of course, there are dozens of ba's in the dictionary, dozens of characters pronounced the same, and it rhymes with fa. And fa, there are hundreds of fa's in a big dictionary, so which fa? So they pick the one fa that they like, and they like the fa that says to develop. To develop what? Well, anything. But their answer is to make money, to develop wealth. That fa can mean anything you want it to mean, but in their mind, ba means fa means money. Go figure. Maybe one more question. Yes. Uh, what if you what if the buildings close together? Nails or glue or wafer? Mortise and tenon structures. That's it. That's it. Occasionally nails in certain kinds of places, but very few. They're not totally necessary, but talking about a traditional structure, the nice thing about mortise and tenon is it shakes. There's a little bit of shake there. They don't build it too tight because all of North China and most of the East Coast is earthquake country. You know Sichuan has great earthquakes. You know the great Tangshan earthquake that killed 300,000 people moments before Mao Zedong died. Horrible events. Build, traditional buildings don't fall down. The Fuguang Temple is there from 857. It's been through thousands of earthquakes because the shearing forces go into the column. The column shakes at the top. Everything a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, and those forces go back down. I helped to build what's still being built in Seattle, a six-acre Chinese garden. Sichuan style, that's my specialty, is Sichuan style. We had an earthquake about three years after we put up our first and only building at that time. And we came out the next morning, we had the last big earthquake in Seattle, we came out the next morning and we looked at the, the paint chips that were shaken off of the major columns and stuff. The farther up you went, the less chipping, out to the lesser parts, no chipping. And we did a scatter pattern. All of the chips that went far out came from low on the columns. So you could see literally how the shearing forces were being dispersed and damped down. So that loose mortise and tenon system and letting your building sit on top of a foundation as opposed to bringing moose back, digging a hole in the ground and packing it all together is what works. And they must have known that. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much, much for coming. Thank you.